Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is game one of six from the 1997 rematch between Gary Kasparov and IBM supercomputer Deep Blue. In this first game, Kasparov has the white side and opens with knight f3, Deep Blue responding with d5, and Kasparov now going with a kingside fianchetto, bishop g4, and also a queenside fianchetto. Knight d7, bishop b2, and pay close attention to this e5 square. And the reason I bring this up is because you'll note in the early stage, white is always in a position to do one of two things. A, prevent black from getting in this e5 advance, or B, meeting an e5 advance with e4. Why is this important? It's important because if black is able to get a pawn on e5, well, that next step that that pawn wants to go to is, of course, e4, where it would hit the knight, and the knight has to run away to a square that maybe it doesn't want to have to run away to. There might not be a better square than f3. In short, a complete domino effect can occur uh, on the white side. Uh, it could turn out very bad if white is not responding in the center or fighting for what's known as your fair share in the center. If black has a pawn on e5, you better be in a position to strike at it with e4. So e6 is played, and for the most part, getting the minor pieces out and getting castled in this very early stage. Knight f6, white castles, c6 reinforces d5. It uh, Well, since this pawn is protected, this becomes a more, uh, more of a possibility in eventual e5 advance. d3, knight's looking at that d2 square more directly, watching over e4 as well. Bishop d6, knight d2, black castles, h3, and the bishop runs back to h5. E3 is a bit of an interesting move, or maybe maybe not so much. Um, Kasparov playing against this computer, not really so welcome to an open type of position. The more open the position, the more possibilities, and the more possibilities, the better off the computer will be. Uh, has no issue, of course, with uh, running any amount of calculations. Uh, another Another way to view it is, well, if you're going to be playing something like e4, I mean, it's a move that could be played, but um, you know, you're know you opening up the position again against computer, and you're also still in a pin right here. You're still having to battle out of a pin. You're opening the position up. Bad things can happen very, very quickly. So something to uh, really steer clear of. It's a little bit of a waiting game, I think, as well, with this e3 advance. Uh, trying to still look for some closed type of position. h3, flight square for that uh, black king. Queen e1 gets out of the pin and is looking for something like knight h2. Soon enough we see that after queen a5, first a3. A lot of pawns on this third rank. A lot of controls is, um, or excuse me, white has a lot of control over the fourth rank. And another curious thing that I came across in this game is that uh, white just plays on these first three ranks for I think really the, the majority of the game at some point we do eventually see e4 or excuse me e5 and then e4 but beyond that there's a whole lot of shuffling that takes place on these first three ranks a lot of maneuvering goes on in this game so after a3 we have I guess some maneuvering by black as well I'm not really I can't really put my finger on what bishop c7 is doing. I guess it stays out of the way of a, I guess, a potential fork with this pawn getting to e5. Um, or may, maybe looking to get on this diagonal. Not really sure what bishop c7 is doing. Still, uh, I guess, a somewhat of a waiting game. Knight h4 is looking to get this uh, f-pawn involved. And we see now the computer playing g5, which is... Probably not one of the top uh, candidate moves you would see a, com uh, a human really considering um, weakening the king position uh, in a tremendous way. F6, H6 in particular, at a moment where you already have a dark square bishop breathing down your neck. This is something that is very crazy to see a human doing, but um, the computer uh, could run all the calculations. It, of course, has no fear. So after G5... Knight comes back, 
and now we have some action in the center. E5 is now met with E4, fighting for, uh, white is fighting for their fair share in the center. And for a handful of moves, we just see these pawns in tension with one another. White will always be in a spot to be meeting D takes E with D takes E. So getting uh, the rook involved, reinforcing a central point, E5. Knight H2, uh, the start of some repositioning. Ideally, uh, this knight would like to make use of F1 and then get to G3. So th this pawn uh, will eventually be needing to move. And it's interesting to see how uh, black makes that not so, not so easy to get in. Queen B6 for starters paves the way for this A pawn to get involved. It also observes something which is unprotected on b2, and of course, it is opposite that white king. So queen c1, the start of uh, repositioning. The queen needs to move before the rook can move, and the rook needs to move before the knights can make use of f1. a5, um, gaining some space on the queen side, and since this pawn is on a3, uh, the, the move a4 well, the knee-jerk reaction to something like a4 is going to be b4, keeping things closed. So rook to e1, bishop d6, looking at this c5 square. You'll note that after the rook is played to e1, this f2 square is a bit soft. The queen is hitting it. Excuse me. The queen is hitting it once. The king is defending it once. It's right now, you could say, unprotected. One attacker, one defender. So with bishop d6... It's looking to get at that weak point. Knight f1. So the, the tension is now resolved in the center. D takes E, D takes E, and now bishop to c5, putting more pressure on f2. But just in time is Kasparov with defending against it with knight to e3. Getting uh, the last piece involved is d blue with rook on a to d8, and now knight to f1. And if black is not uh, accurate at this point, I think that... Uh, Kasparov can obtain uh, a strategic, uh, a, vi a very good strategic advantage, uh, which is to say the continuation. Let, let me just make a, a nothing type of move. If we were to see king g7, we could have something like g4. The bishop, of course, has to react, and then knight g3. And you'll note that white has um, the possibility of getting into that f5 square. And this bishop is just kind of out of play. It's difficult to get it working. This bishop could maybe always come about by way of f1. I think this would be a very strong position for white to get into. Still a, a closed position on the king side, and then stuff can happen on the queen side. This bishop is, in, in my mind, it, it starts to be a big issue. It's not really contributing at all. So this is not uh, allowed. We, we're not seeing king g7 but instead g4, but I believe that that would be the strategical, this is the strategical threat to trying to get in g4. Uh, if, you, if you try to do that, one thing that's interesting is that if you're trying to get in this uh, g4 move right now, well, it doesn't come in time, because you'll know after the bishop plays to g6, white is now having to react to e4. If this knight was already, if this knight was already on f1, if when the bishop goes to g6, the knight plays to g3 and is defending that e4 square for a second time. So it's just, it's not happening in time if g4 is being played right now. But with the knight on f1, it is being threatened. Black addresses that with g4. h takes g, knight takes g, and f3 was a little crazy for me to see when I was first reviewing this game. Um, just, you know, welcoming an absolute pin on that e3 knight. Knight takes, knight takes, and bishop to e7. Okay, there's still this pin, and with this bishop e7 move, uh, deep blue is looking to still place that knight in a pin, just on a different diagonal, and I believe indirectly looking at that d2 square. Uh, at some point, I think getting a rook to that second rank uh, would be, uh, of course, a very good thing. So it has a couple things. I believe in mind by making use of g5. So first first things first, get out of the pin, king h1, bishop g5, rook to e2, looking to eventually get the queen 
off of this diagonal. There's actually a couple pins going on with rook e2. Not only is the knight pinned, but so too is this pawn on f3, which is something that black looks to exploit. But first we have some action on the queen side. a4 is met with, b4 keeping things closed. And now f5 coming right at white, opening up the position or at least trying to open it up a bit more where white is in the side where white is the side that's in these uh, uncomfortable pins, the knight and this pawn. E takes F, E4 is played, pressure on that F pawn, but we just have F4 giving up this rook. We do have bishop takes rook right away, and this is this is one point in the game where I thought, well, why not first maybe take this pawn on F4? Let's let's have a quick look at why maybe that was not played first. And the, the reason it wasn't played is because after G takes bishop, bishop takes rook, we would have the very calm but deadly queen to d2, hitting up the bishop and also threatening to just get on this highly weakened diagonal, this dark square diagonal. If, for example, the bishop reacts by playing to h5, queen c3, what do you do about the queen getting to g7? Just showing one continuation. If rook e7 to defend, we could have first knight c4 hitting the queen, queen to c7, and now we could land a check, king here, land another check. This is not necessarily the best continuation, but I believe it's clear enough to see that at this point, after queen takes pawn, the threat of grabbing the bishop and also giving check here is going to be uh, favorable for white, or just winning for white, I should say. Black at this point is completely busted and needing to give back a lot of material, at least a minor piece at this point. If the bishop is reacting, knight d6, the queen has to give herself up. So we're not seeing that uh, at this point. That's why at this point right, right here, after f4, we're not seeing bishop takes f4, but instead just bishop takes rook. So uh, black who is, with this last sequence of moves, really going for material, which is maybe one of the downsides uh, for the computer, putting too much of a value on uh, material. Uh, F takes G, and now knight to E5. This is another point. Pawn takes is killed right away with pick your favorite square, knight C4 or D5, both of which would be hitting that queen. If the knight is taken, we just have a mate in three. The queen and bishop both converging on G7 with this pawn around. It's going to be leading to mate. Queen blocks, you just take mate. Nothing you could do. So that's why we're not having h takes g there of course because of the knight move to one of those two but instead knight e5 trying to re reduce this bishop's mobility getting the rook involved as well but now with g6 we have connected pass pawns um this could be this could turn out to be very dangerous very quickly bishop f bishop f3 bishop to c3 keeping a close eye on d2 ruling out the possibility for the rook to make use of that second rank. Queen b5, and Kasparov now just looking to get uh, rid of the queens, and that happens. Queen takes, rook takes. h5, unfortunately for black, there's not really a whole lot that can be done here. This pawn, in particular, and bishop are controlling, or I should say doing a very good job in controlling entry points that this rook might have. It's on an open file, but where where can it go next? It's not really able to pivot on any square where it could function laterally. So h5 is played. King g1 gets out of the pin. King f8, and again, for the most part, it's just a lot of shuffling on the black side. Bishop h3, b5, uh, rules out any knight c4 ideas. Um, for example, if we did have something like uh, rook to rook to d7. And let me just point out the reasons why we're not having, let's say, rook moves. Uh, we're ha we're having king moves because if you move the rooks, you'll know moving this rook is allows a pawn advance with tempo. Similarly, if this rook moves, a pawn advance with tempo. And well, where else is there to go? If you go to uh, if you go to d6, 
could always grab the knight and then make use of that c4 square with the fork. Um, so again, not really a whole lot to do after bishop h3. b5 does take away that possibility of a potential fork with first grabbing the knight, but we just have deep blue making a whole lot of king moves in a position where it's, it's hard to make any improvements. These pawns are very, very strong. g4 is the break. This knight is now in a pin. If uh, the king was not making use of g7, uh, we could still have this g4 move coming about. Uh, white is able to provide an additional supporter for its advance. But king g7 is tried, g4. King h6 gets out of the pin, rook g1, bunch of exchanges on g4. And after the smoke clears, uh, a very basic end game. Uh, black is still up the exchange, but again, these pawns, these connected pass pawns are invaluable. Rook d6 hitting at f5. The main threat here for white is really to just play to f6 and then play to h4, which is going to be main. So that's being addressed with rook d5. F6 is played. There's no reason to not keep pushing those pawns. Rook d1 and after g7, we have uh, deep blue resigning this first game of six. There's no way to prevent g8 equaling queen or combination of f7. However you slice it, these pawns will be promoting and uh, the rooks are going to have to give themselves up. So uh, that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye.